Okay, welcome. Very warm, warm welcome. Good evening, everyone. Um, and thank you very much uh, for taking the time. We're, we're really delighted that you're here, and we hope you'll, you'll enjoy the evening. Um, I'm Nick Johansson. I'm director at the Kent Downs Area of Outstanding Natural Beauty, and I head up the UK side of our exciting ambition to become a UNESCO Global Geopark, more of which in a bit. Before the main show, we have a short video, which we love, and so you're going to see it, whether you like it or not. <laughs> we hope you love it too. Love it. Um, and I wonder if you spotted which bits were in France and which bit were bits were in Kent. It kind of emphasises the single nature of our shared landscapes. So this incredible Salt Plus Earth Festival is very much part of that journey that the video talks to. Our journey to secure cross-channel, two countries, uh, UNESCO Global Geopark status. That's for us, for the Kent Downs Area of Outstanding Natural Beauty, the Strait of Dover, the marine element, and our colleagues in France at the Parc Naturel Régional. So you've just joined us on the journey, and thank you for being here, because when people get involved, when people support, when they celebrate and enjoy the landscapes, then the geopark becomes real. Geoparks are very much about people. But geoparks are also, also draw on the internationally important geology of our landscapes. And, and we have that here in Kent and in the Pas de Calais in spades. I was going to say in buckets and spades, but definitely in spades. Um, and nowhere else is that more apparent than our coasts. And much of the festival focuses around the coastal area um, of, of uh, near Folkestone, but extends across the, the North Downs, the Kent Downs. Now, last year, our friend Professor Gupta, Sandy, Sanjeev Gupta, inspired us with the story of the mega flood 450,000 years ago, which created the channel, the channel which we argue connects the landscapes. Um, this year, who better than writer, explorer, and much, much more, Nick Crane, who will, in his own words, which he mentioned to me just a moment ago, will conduct a scamper across the last 6,000 years of the landscapes of both sides of the channel. Those landscapes which we hope will soon be a UNESCO Global Geo Park. So enough of this, Nick, and over to Nick.
Thank you, uh, Nick, very much indeed. And thank you um, for inviting me, uh, because this is one of the most inspiring projects I've come across for a very, very long time. Um, I'm going to begin by picking up where Sanji, Professor Sanjeev Gupta left off last year um, with his mega flood. Um, I'm sure some of you, or maybe all of you are here for, for the lecture. It was completely amazing. Uh, it was one of the most amazing stories uh, I've ever heard of any sort, fact or fiction, the geological evolution of the English Channel from river valley to mega flood caused by the bursting or perhaps the overtopping um, of a vast, uh, vast, vast lake of glacial meltwater as it, as it burst through a, a, a fairly relatively weak portion of land. But this wasn't just um, any old mega flood, but a mega flood with waterfall plunge pools that were the biggest on earth, right outside these windows. The noise must have been incredible. Well, since that mega flood, uh, the channel uh, has acted as the watercourse for the combined flows of the River Trent and the River Thames, the Meuse, the Rhine and the Scheldt, and then in very recent times, geologically speaking, the land bridge known as Doggerland, there it is in uh, green on the right-hand side of the, the, the map, was breached by rising sea levels and the English Channel became the connecting seaway between the North Sea and the Mid-Atlantic. So that's 450,000 years and 45 seconds, I'm afraid. Um, now, um, as we know, uh, every body of water, whether it's an ocean or a river, is defined by its edges, where the water meets the land, where salt meets earth, or in this case, where salt meets chalk. Now, what I'd like to do this evening, following on from Professor Gupta's uh, mag mega flood epic last year, is look at just a few of the human stories told by the channel and its pair of mirrored landscapes, its two edges, the Kent Downs AONB, there it is on the left there, and the Parc Naturel Regional des Capes Marais d'Opal there on the right, one AONB and one PNR. Together with the channel between them, they are the aspiring cross-channel UNESCO Global Geopark. Um, and as I say, this is one of the most inspiring, exciting projects I've been lucky enough to be invited to partake in in recent years. It's completely incredible. It makes enormous sense. Now, what we have then are these three areas linked through their chalk geology and their shared human stories. This section of the English Channel, La Manche, the sleeve uh, in translation, is one of the busiest stretches of waterway in the world for marine traffic. But it's much more than just a bit of salt water. The channel includes deep water shipping lanes, fishing grounds, critical marine ecosystems, and a multifarious variety of coastal topography, topography from bays and beaches to cliffs and tidal rivers. UK AONBs uh, and French PNRs have a lot in common. Both designations concentrate on the countryside, the conservation, protection of natural beauty and heritage, on sustainable economic development. Of the 100 or so PNRs and AONBs in France and the UK, these two are completely unique, connected by a shared water bridge and by shared geology and landscape. This is what makes this project so exciting. From space or on a map like this, the combined area looks a bit like a beckoning arm reaching out from the French heartland towards London. The land areas share beauty and tranquility, a diverse range of habitats from wetlands and chalk streams to grassland, woodland and hedgerows. Both areas are rich in history and in routes for cycling and walking, so sustainable tourism. And here, uh, a very pale dashed line running from bottom right to top left is the Via Francigena, the Pilgrim's Road, wending its way from Canterbury towards Rome. Both areas, as you'll notice from the map, are really well served by historic centres that are also hubs for public transport, from the Port Quartet of Dover and Calais, Folkestone and Boulogne, to inland centres of Canterbury and St. Omer. In short, the proposed cross-channel geopark, Geopark Transmanche, embraces key landscapes and seascapes, 
at the historic meeting point between two neighboring countries. And on the world map, it is very difficult to locate an area that compares with this one. The proposed geopark is a unique area of extraordinary diversity, and this makes for some outstanding human stories. So, let's flip back in time. Uh, Sanjeev took us back 450,000 years, which is going to pop back a very short time indeed, only 6,000 years. The mega flood uh, is in the distant past. Uh, since then, the Ice Age has waxed and waned, and a new way of living has crept westwards from the fertile crescent, the lands of the Tigris and the Euphrates in what is now Iraq, all the way across Turkey, and it's moved into Europe. By, say, about 5,000 BC, not that long ago, really, people in northern France here, around what is now the port of Calais and Boulogne, were living in full-time settlements, farming for wheat, keeping domesticated animals, cattle, sheep, pigs, goats, and they're also mining for flint, mining, digging holes in the ground to get the flint out of the ground that they can use for making the sickles that they use at harvest time and for a range of farming tools and, of course, weapons. Uh, now, these people are not just living in uh, full-time settlements and farming and mining, but they're also creating an extraordinary range of megastructures. This is the site of the Neolithic causeway enclosure on uh, Mont Dubert, just inland from Cap Blancnais. It's perched on the white cliffs, the white cliffs of Artois, with spectacular views across the channel to the coast of Kent, and it dominates the surrounding countryside. Now, it doesn't look too much now. In fact, it's virtually invisible uh, on, its, on its promontory. But causeway enclosures were incredibly important. Uh, at the beginning of the Neolithic, the, the, uh, the New Stone Age. They don't appear to have had a defensive function uh, because the surrounding ditch and bank around them was pierced at intervals by gaps or causeways. So perhaps we, sh we should think of causeway enclosures as, as social enclosures maybe or communal places. The archaeological finds are suggestive of a carnivorous Stone Age Glastonbury at places like this. Vast amounts of flint and pottery, faunal remains from cattle, goats and pigs. Here, on this site, on this causeway enclosure, they found 3,865 litres of marine shells. So they liked their seafood, but ominously also, there were 2,000 fragments of human bones, some burned and some freshly chopped, hints perhaps at cannibalism. Archaeologists view the site as having been used by uh, what they call a fully agrarian society. So this is a culture that's related to cultivation, uh, landed property, um, even if those agrarian farmers thought it was fashionable to cook their own species. Meanwhile, across the water uh, in Britain, we have a relative wilderness, a wild game park with just a few thousand people. Now, numbers are very difficult to pin down for the late Mesolithic in Britain, but some archaeologists reckon it may be as low as 10,000 people on the whole island of Britain. And those uh, hunter-gatherers are living their ancient tribal lives. Um, Kent in the Mesolithic was a wooded land where deer and wild boar vastly outnumbered human beings whose preferred habitat was river valleys close to fresh water where they could find fish and fowl. Um, there are a couple of interesting sites in Kent. Uh, this is uh, Chiddingston, um, uh, just outside the ONB actually. Uh, but uh, the River Len at Harrietsham, uh, within the AONB, just east of Maidstone, and Mesolithic scrapers and microliths, those are tiny little chips of flint, have been found. And here at Chillingstone, uh, where there's a spring, just west of Tunbridge, Mesolithic flints and hearths have been found uh, close to rock shelters. Uh, this is also Chillingstone. Um, uh, and Kent was very unusual uh, because, uh, unlike uh, many other parts of Mesolithic Britain, uh, Kent did have its own um, uh, sandstone, which made for perfect um, uh, outcrops that could make uh, temporary Mesolithic camps. So unlike their neighbours across the channel in what is now France, where they were living in all the year round settled communities, farming and mining and so on, 
the people in Kent were highly mobile, uh, they had no permanent settlements, and they were, if you like, living on the hoof. They were nomadic, and um, they were um, incredibly attuned to their landscapes. You had to be, if you were effectively nomadic and moving all the time, you had to know a vast amount um, about your locality or your region. You had, your mental maps were incredibly sophisticated, and of course, travel was seasonal. Um, there are no permanent Mesolithic um, monuments to go and look at in, in, uh, in Britain. Uh, and there's no evidence in Kent that people were <coughs> excuse me, building permanent structures to live in. It's possible, likely perhaps, that Mesolithic people were controlling the wild herds or creating protected areas where they could harvest nutritious cereals and so on. But they, that's not the same as conventional fixed farming. Um, now, how did they move around? Because Mesolithic people were effectively um, nomadic. Uh, they moved where the food and uh, raw materials were. And um, uh, they had what I'm, I'm writing, uh, researching a book on, on footpaths at the moment. So I spent quite a lot of the last couple of years thinking about uh, the Mesolithic and what the routes would have looked like that people moved along. Uh, there weren't enough people to create what we think, think of as footpaths. They're just The footfall wasn't regular enough to create a permanent mark in the grassland or the woodland. So they were moving along what um, can be thought of as routeways, using waymarks. So a tree with a broken branch, uh, a rock with a particular configuration, perhaps a chalk outcrop that shone white in the moonlight, uh, other way marks might be the meeting of two streams, uh, an isolated tree, a sequence of glades in the woodland. So they would memorize all of these notable way marks and use them to join the dots on their, on their routeways. Uh, they tended to migrate with the seasons. Um, uh, and uh, I've, uh, of all of the prehistoric eras, this is the one that uh, I personally accord with most closely because back in the 90s, I spent a year and a half walking across Europe from west to east, following the mountain ranges from Spain to Turkey, always in the mountains. It took uh, it was about 10,000 kilometers of solitary walking before the age of mobile phones and GPS. I didn't have a tent. I slept under the stars or in caves or in forests and so on. Um, and I became very lunar. Um, and I've, I felt I gathered in that year and a half of being alone in the mountains, always moving, always because I, I was trying to reach Istanbul. So I was always waking up and thinking, walk towards the rising sun, walk towards the rising sun. Simple, simple day, my very low stress activity. And my whole thing was incredibly easy compared to work doing a job. Um, and um, I, I, with time, it took me about three or four months to settle into the rhythm of the moon because the, the sun's, you know, it just comes and goes every day. It's quite boring. The moon is extraordinary because, of course, it has, it's different every single night. And uh, as, it, as it wanes and, and disappears, the nights become very black indeed. And all you can, all you can see is just this diffused um, glow of the starlight. But on the night of a full moon, uh, and I didn't have a torch, it's as bright as day. It's nearly as bright as daylight. So I could walk all night if I wanted. I often did. I was kind of suffused with intense physical energy every time there's a full moon. And, um, uh, you know, the, 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 there's a reason uh, for that awful term, loony. Um, it's something to be embraced and enjoyed. Uh, and uh, I can clearly remember after about six months of walking, climbing a pine tree in the Cévennes and shrieking at the moon with delight. Um, and it seemed a completely normal way of, uh, of enjoying that moment of, of ecstasy. So I kind of feel I know a little bit about how Mesolithic people were, were operating uh, and how, what they thought of their landscape. They, so they had no idea, or if they did know, they were in denial that people only 20 miles away across the channel were living in effectively villages um, and weren't shrieking uh, at the moon uh, every four weeks. Um, uh, everything changed very suddenly and dramatically uh, for the people in Kent and the southeast in 4050 BC when small groups of these farming people began to make the boat crossing across the channel to southeast Britain, bringing with them their ideas, their wheat seeds and their domesticated animals and their ideas of structures uh, because unlike 
the hunter-gatherers of Britain who were effectively camping in brushwood shelters. Effectively, and I, I, people in, I've been with people in Africa who still live in brushwood shelters, uh, camel nomads. It's a very comfortable way of living, but highly uh, innovative, actually. Um, but these people moved into, into Britain in their small boats, uh, and they brought with them rectangular buildings, the idea of living in rectangular buildings. There were no, no as far as I know, not a single Mesolithic rectangular building has been found anywhere in Britain. Um, so this is a completely new idea. And the earliest known rectangular building, Neolithic rectangular building in Britain, is in Kent, uh, on the HS1 line, um, just above the Medway. So uh, this was, I and mean, people call it um, a revolution. Uh, I think it was much more than that. You know, this was uh, kind of cultural Armageddon. Uh, you, you, you basically got an island with maybe 10, 20,000 max people living on it, hunter-gatherers, who were suddenly actually invaded by this completely new uh, sort of person and a group, uh, a suite of ideas. Now, um, the most enduring physical reminder uh, of these uh, incomers has proved to be that the long barrow, uh, I'm sure many of you know the Coldrum long barrow in Kent, uh, but long barrows were kind of monumental burial chambers. Think of them as a sepulchre. Um, they were frequently erected on vantage points of some sort. And these were built a thousand years before Stonehenge. So th this, this is, you know, forget Stonehenge, this is much more original as a structure. Um, and the, you could only build these if you had a huge surplus of person power because uh, it takes hundreds, perhaps thousands of person hours to drag rocks, uh, configure them so that they don't collapse, often uh, with, a, uh, with a chamber so the roofs disappeared on cauldron, but the, they were invariably roofed with, with stone. We'll see a photograph of one in a second. And then they were mounded with earth. Well, if you were um, uh, uh, fighting on a subsistence uh, uh, ec economy just to feed yourself and your family, your community, you wouldn't have had time to divert to building these gigantic uh, burial chambers. So it would appear that this incoming culture of Neolithic people from across the water uh, were living so efficiently on their farms that they could divert adult um, building power to erecting these, these megastructures. And there are quite a few of them. So there's another one called Kits Coty, I'm sure you know, on the North Downs Way, on the, the Cuxton to Detling section of the North Downs Way. I think it's also on the Aylesford Rail Trail, walking trail in the AONB. Um, Kent was a, effectively a Neolithic bridgehead. Um, and we shouldn't just think about the people who arrived as farmers and miners, because they were at the kind of the spearhead of ideas that led to villages, to towns, to cities, dedicated places for making food, farms and so on, dedicated places for living. So this was the beginning, if you like, of something that we'd uh, describe as civilization, perhaps. Uh, that's not to denigrate hunter-gatherers. I'm, I'm in the hunter-gatherer camp very much. Um, so here are three examples of uh, Neolithic uh, kind of megastructures that spread from Kent incredibly fast. So you think that... So my, my theory is, and I, I wrote a book about this a while ago called Making the British Landscape, plug, plug, is that the, um, the, pe the, 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 the farmers, the, the chosen sea route for the farmers was from Padacale, They'd obviously crossed the shortest possible stretch on a day like this when it's flat, calm, and windless. They'd have come to the White Cliffs. Now, it's possible that the White Cliffs were just a bit too daunting and that they coasted. They hugged the coast around St. Margaret's Bay uh, through what was then the Wonsum Channel because the Isle of Thanet was separated from the mainland by a, a navigable channel. And that actually they came at Kent from the Medway from the north which is how you get this rectangular building uh, above the Medway, um, this, this key rectangle, and, and indeed the Coldrum Stones and Kitscote. You know, there are quite a little gathering of Neolithic sites um, on, on that uh, northern Kent edge that would have been accessible from effectively the, 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 the outer reaches of the Thames. So within 200 years, only 200 years, this is so fast. You think this is before the age of mobile phones and social media. These ideas had spread from Kent and Sussex to Scotland and Wales. Only 200 years. You know, we're talking about thousands, only 200 years. So here we've got a long barrow at West Kennet on the left, 
a very famous wet long barrow, enormous long barrow in, uh, in Wiltshire. Uh, top right is uh, uh, a portal dolmen, a burial chamber, a megalithic burial chamber in Pembrokeshire. And bottom right, um, actually, to my mind, the most interesting early Neolithic site anywhere in the southeast, but it's definitely not the most spectacular because it's not that rectangle you can see. Uh, there's a rectangular bank and ditch, uh, top dead center in that, in that photograph there, the, the very green bottom right hand one. But it's the moguls. Look at the, the grass hummocks. Uh, I'm sure some of you know what those are, but this is, this is the, uh, the Harrow Hill, um, just behind Worthing and Brighton. Uh, those are flint mines, early Neolithic flint mines. Now we have to ask ourselves, why were these farmers digging holes in the ground to pick up flint when, as we know, you know, if you walk the North Downs Way, there are flints lying all around all over the place on the surface. You don't have to dig them out of holes. So this is a completely different new way of doing things. Now, I've heard many theories. I'd like to ask Sanjeev about this, but because I've, I, there's a guy called James Dilley, who's, who's a, a Britain's probably most successful young modern flint napper. When I asked him why early Neolithic people might have been digging mines to extract flint for their tools and weapons rather than just picking up any one of trillions of nodules lying on the surface. He said, well, he said, perhaps it's because the, the flint from its in situ seams five meters, 10 meters down is, is slightly more elastic and, and works better when you're trying to make blades. Um, I don't know geologically or chemically whether that's true or not. Um, I've tried napping myself with James and it's a complete fiasco. Um, I need to cut my own arm off, but um, uh, James can make an ax head in about 10 minutes from a raw lump of flint, Emo amazing. Anyway, I'm getting um, distracted. Uh, so, um, so here, it, so 200 years only to spread these megastructures across uh, effectively the whole of England, um, including causewayed enclosures like that one we saw on the, on the cliff in France. Uh, Windmill Hill, for those of you who've been to Avebury, is one of the earliest causewayed enclosures in, in Britain. Uh, hardly see it on the ground now, but these were immense things. And as Sanjeev reminded me earlier this evening, we have to remember that these early Neolithic structures in the chalklands um, would have blazed white in the sunlight and the moonlight. They would have been spectacular. Um, so they, they don't look today how they looked when they were built. They were much, much more spectacular. We have to think of a kind of the Piccadilly, megalithic Piccadilly Circus, really. Now, what about those routeways? Um, I told you that uh, in the Mesolithic, in Mesolithic Britain, we, we, we effectively had no footpaths because there simply weren't enough people to make marks on the ground like this. Well, by the time we've got the Neolithic cultures arriving, basically what you have are population nodes, people gathering in fixed places. They're there all the year round. They've got their fields, they've got their burial chambers, they've got their routes to uh, places that they've designated for defecation, they've got routes to the drinking water place. So actually, again, you've effectively got you know, gatherings of tens of people in one location walking the same route daily, month in, month out, year in, year out. So you get these things appearing on the landscape, which we can think of as footpaths. And of course, a footpath on chalk uh, landscapes is a very beautiful physical thing. Uh, where I grew up in Norfolk, a footpath is you know, a muddy, squelchy mess. A footpath in chalklands you know, looks like this. It's a gorgeous thing that you can follow in the middle of the night without falling over. They are very clear. And I've, I've often asked myself, because one of the most unfortunate things about the Mesolithic and Neolithic, um, indeed, um, uh, until 2,000 years ago, we have no written records. So we don't know what they thought of their routeways or their, their, their footpaths or their settlements or how, what they thought about the environment or their neighbours, um, how they interacted. We just don't know. They left no records other than what archaeologists can tell us. So um, uh, the population rose, footpaths became much more of a, of a, of a feature, um, a structure, if you like. Footpaths became a structure. Um, and uh, we have to think, as I, as I was coming down the old high street uh, this afternoon, I'm sure you all know, I passed that fantastic uh, wall display of Hamish Fulton's uh, creative Folkestone artwork. Uh, and I'm a great fan of Hamish Fulton. He creates artwork from walking routes. And if next time you're at the bottom of Old High Street, just have a look at it and see what, what he's created. So it's basically a, a gigantic European map of, of footpaths. Uh, and, that, and so that map, that's the kind of map that these people are carrying in their heads. Um, I walked 10,000 kilometers, what's that, 7,000 miles in a year and a half. So 
it wasn't a pro it was definitely not a problem to walk a thousand miles a year in any direction. So we shouldn't think about people as being locked into one location because these Neolithic people, although they weren't regular nomads, somehow axe heads from the Lake District were ending up in the Thames and vice so that they were trading. So people were still covering big distances, swapping artifacts for whatever reason. So um, let's skip forward um, because I'm going to end up um, doing um, thousands of years every second at this rate. Uh, to the Bronze Age, and um, so a 2,500-year leap. Um, still, we're, we're staying very much staying in, in, in the AONB and the PNR, uh, because back then uh, the PNR and AONB were connected by the Bronze Age equivalent of cross-channel ferries, the Bronze Age boats. Uh, there's a, obviously, there's a fantastic replica here in the, in the Dover Museum. Uh, Dover Muse Museum claim it to be the world's oldest known seagoing boat. It was in use about 1500 BC. It is an incredible thing, uh, and it appears to have been absolutely huge. So it was built from oak planks, pegged with oak wedges, stitched with wig, uh, twigs of yew wood. It was probably 60 foot long. Uh, this is just a fragment of it. They couldn't get it all out. 18 meters. It was eight feet broad. It weighed eight tons, and it took 20 paddlers to drive it through the water, and it could take a two tons of cargo. So um, it's thought this may have been used as a cargo ship for um, moving tin and bronze from Cornwall and Dorset uh, up here to Transmanche. Um, I was lucky enough when I was filming Coast, I did a lot of amazing things filming Coast, um, to, uh, to be a paddler in this Bronze Age boat. This is a replica uh, and uh, down in Falmouth. And um, uh, they wouldn't let us go out onto the middle of the English Channel because of uh, you know, BBC health and safety regulations, tragically. But um, we had a really good go at it. And um, very stable, incredibly hard work to paddle because they're very heavy. Uh, this huge um, uh, cargo capacity. But actually, one of the things that fascinated me most about it was the fact that its flat bottom would have been a brilliant, of course, for estuary work. Um, because this is before the age of you know, the port of Dover and port of Folkestone. So... Uh, these boats had to be beached or driven onto mud in estuaries, so they needed a flat bottom. Um, and um, <laughs> one, one, of, one of the problems with this particular boat is that the, uh, the seagulls were trying to eat the moss and the sheep fat that was used to make the hull watertight, so it was pretty wet inside it. Um, so uh, moving on uh, we're into the Iron Age, uh, by the Iron Age we can see shipping uh, becoming, uh, if you like, the maritime equivalent of a, of a land footpath, funneling coinage and products from the continent to Britain. And across the water also came, for the first time, the concept of towns. Um, particularly amazing story uh, in Gaul, Roman Gaul, France, uh, this is um, uh, maybe 50 BC, 100 BC, uh, we have these settlements uh, known by archaeologists as Oppida, uh, that were kind of proto-towns. Uh, these were much bigger than villages. They were minting their own coins. They're often defensive structures. And they had hundreds, if not thousands, of people living in them. Well, uh, when Caesar sailed from Boulogne in the PNR across, we don't know where he landed, but somewhere around here, uh, on, the, on that recce in 55 BC uh, for an invasion that changed the course of British history, he brought with him, we would have brought with him knowledge of these, these towns, which were already training, trading with, with southern Britain, so the to and fro. So this idea that towns became more and more embedded. And of course, once the Romans invaded um, properly, uh, they set up over 100 uh, uh, Romano-British towns in Britain, all of which incidentally collapsed when the Roman occupation finished. So it wasn't that, the, uh, you know, we got them, we got them uh, late and we lost them early. Uh, we were, just weren't ready for, to be townies. But I um, don't want to get diverted again. So let's skip forward. I'm gonna go through a sequence of map making because maps, uh, I'm rather keen on maps. Uh, and we can see here a very interesting evolution of the way Kent and the AONB was perceived on map making. So map making in Britain, there were, there was, uh, there were effectively no useful maps made left by the Romans. Uh, uh, the earliest uh, um, useful maps of Britain started cropping up in the early Middle Ages. So this particular one uh, is, it was bound into a volume used by Gerald of Wales, who made a journey around the perimeter of Wales in 1188, recruiting uh, archers uh, for the Third Crusade. Um, and this, this map here, uh, so uh, 12th century, can be seen kind of as the beginning of putting Britain on maps. It's not a printed map, we haven't got 
printing hasn't taken off yet. So Kent, as you can see down there, um, so Easter's at the top, if you're confused, Easter at the top. Uh, Scotland's bottom left, Scotia, uh, on this kind of banana potato shaped place. That's, that's Britain, Great Britain. Obviously not looking very great in this map, looking a bit, bit sat upon by Europe. Nothing new. Um, and uh, at the right-hand end, you've got a place that you, th you would think at first glance, because that's obviously the Thames, isn't it, coming in there. Uh, but you'd think, oh, that must be Canterbury. It isn't. It's Winchester. Uh, so Canterbury hasn't made it onto the, uh, the European map yet. Winchester has. But actually, what I want you to just look at on this map is the way the, the waterways are so prominent. So this is a map of, if you like, European connections seen uh, across water. Um, and uh, effectively, it's, it's, it's a bit like one of those airline magazines you get in the seat, uh, in the seat uh, uh, holder showing principal destinations, except that the airline here is, is, uh, is actually Holyjet. Um, and the, um, the principal destinations are Rome, Constantinople, uh, Constantinople and, and Winchester. So these were like pilgrimage places. And the water, the sea and the rivers, the Thames and the Seine. So that opposite the Thames, you've got the Seine. Uh, are being used as the an avenues into Britain and across the continent. So, um, but just, just, just link for a moment, think of the location of Kent. So that's not Canterbury, but just look how well-placed Kent is, you know, on the medi early medieval map. Absolutely where you need to be if you want to travel into the heart of Britain up the Thames and into the heart of Europe up the Seine. Um, very well-placed indeed. So let's skip forward uh, to uh, 1595. Um, now, um, I'm, a bit, I'm a big fan of Mercator, not least because I wrote a biography about him. Um, so I'm slightly, uh, slightly biased. Uh, he was, in my opinion, the world's greatest map maker, uh, not least because he came up with this singular method of, uh, of uh, altering the three-dimensional sphere of the world into the two-dimensional plane of a flat map in such a way that a compass bearing remained constant whether you put it on the deck of a ship or on a flat map. And that's why the Mercator projection is so amazing. He's the first person who worked out how to do it. But he did many other things too. He's much less well known for his world atlas of what he called these modern maps. So this is the Kent sheet of his modern maps in his world atlas. Um, it is an amazing map. It's, at the time, this was the most accurate map of Kent ever printed. Um, have a look at the red dot places, Dover, Sandwich, Maidstone, Tunbridge, Folkestone, they're all on there, uh, the, the red dots. Um, uh, so those are the main, the main settlements. Um, and he got, he got a lot of information from Christopher Saxton, an English uh, map maker who'd already produced, uh, published a set of county maps for England and Wales, but Saxton was much more erratic uh, Mercator was, if you like, a mathematical cartographer. He was very interested in coordinates and in projections and in, if you like, um, uh, the truth of map making. Um, so, so if we skip forward again, let's have a look at where uh, map making had got to um, uh, 200 years later. So this is a, um, I'm afraid I couldn't get a sharper, a sharper image than this one, but this is um, the plan of the triangles linking Paris and Greenwich. Um, so if you think about it, if we've got national map making, the French had got maps of France, Mercator had made maps, although he was a Fleming, he was living in the continent, but we got, we got county maps of Britain, but the two weren't connected up. So how did you know where Britain was in relation to France? You know, they were independent entities. No, we'd actually made, fixed the two coasts together. So if you like, they knew the channel was there, but where exactly were the two countries? You know, a bit that way, a bit this way, you know. So the only way around this was to uh, undertake an incredibly complicated uh, triangulation exercise where you um, use Euclidean geometry to, uh, to uh, and, and the, tri the corners of triangles uh, to uh, measure accurate distances and locations. And so they used the uh, Boulogne and the top of uh, the uh, church in, um, in Calais to connect across the water to Dover on clear days. And measuring the angles between the high points, they could measure the distances and the relative locations. So this was a, a really big development. And if you like, it connected right across the geopark now. When you think about it, this is exactly where the geopark is. This was the first time the two countries had been cartographically connected. It's a hugely, hugely important development. It made it possible to, to map the relative locations of England and France on the world atlas. 
And we can think about these lines on this map here as symbols connecting the two countries, connecting an island to a continent. Um, and of course, nowadays, many more lines connect the two countries, the Channel Tunnel, countless cables and pipes, cross-channel ferry routes, and of course, the, the courses swum by cross-channel swimmers. So lots of different lines now intersecting to and fro across the Straits of, of Dover. Now, um, before we leave mapping altogether, I just want to leave you one more, because uh, it is, uh, uh, one, again, a, a little-known cartographic nerdy fact, but um, you've all heard of the Ordnance Survey, uh, and I'm sure you've all used Ordnance Survey one-inch-to-the-mile maps. I'm sufficiently ancient that I grew up using one-inch-to-the-mile maps. Uh, my dad said, go and get the one-inch number you know, 98 and we'll go for a bike ride. Or something. So I knew exactly what he meant. So the one-inch-to-mile maps were the first uh, maps to show a land in sufficient detail. You could follow footpaths, uh, country lanes, every village and hamlet was marked, and every single uh, uh, metal road was marked on a one-inch-to-mile map, and many uh, cart, cart tracks and footpaths too. So uh, the very first Ordnance Survey one-inch-to-the-mile map published uh, in 1801 uh, was of Kent. Uh, and uh, here it is on the left here, um, uh, a completely amazing map, uh, very rare, and um, superseded now by Land Ranger 189, so the one inch to the mile became one to 50,000. Um, but this is pretty much the same map um, as this one here. And so, the scale's very similar, um, but obviously been updated a lot. Um, so Kent was regarded by the Ordnance Survey, as it was by Mercator, as being a key county to uh, map accurately. So um, let's go from, we need to keep moving forward, from cartographic endeavor to uh, military front lines. Um, who knows what this is? Yeah, a lot of you all know what it is. <laughs> I mean, if I'd asked somebody in London what that, they'd just thought, what, you know? <laughs> so you all know exactly what it is. This is one of the extraordinary sound mirrors um, built before the age of radar to detect approaching enemy airplanes across the channel. Uh, and this one's just outside Folkestone, um, as you all know. Um, so, uh, very amusing time, uh, little, little story. I'm filming with Coast when there's another set of sound mirrors a uh, little bit uh, west of here, uh, including a sound wall. And we, rigged, we got Loughborough University to join in with some acoustic engineers. We hired a Tiger Moth biplane. Uh, had all sorts of very sensitive BBC microphones and so on, uh, and got up in the dark. Uh, and I was, uh, it was all live filmed, so it wasn't, this wasn't fixed at all. Um, and uh, the trick, so what we were trying to establish was that I, as the presenter, would be able to hear through the sound, I had a kind of gigantic copper hearing uh, horn in the middle of the sound mirror, that I would hear the approaching aeroplane before the acousticians detected it with their ears. And whoever heard it first was going to shout. Well, I heard it with, with the sound mirror long before the acousticians heard it. And uh, so they did work, but of course were pretty quickly um, superseded by, by radar. Um, so uh, this brings me to the First World War, because this is what the era that we're talking about. And um, I, I must say, walking around uh, Folkestone uh, today, looking for places I never got to see when I was filming here, because it's also brisk, I found it incredibly moving. Um, I, uh, I didn't know about the Road of Remembrance, uh, but I did know that my, both my grandfathers served in the First World War. One grandfather was in the trenches for four years until he was captured, Battle of Somme and everything, and the other was working on a, as a doctor on a hospital ship in the Channel. Uh, two of my great uncles were killed in the First World War, two of them made it back, but I've got their diaries and I know they they sailed from Folkestone to Boulogne, and I didn't know about the Road of Remembrance, and I found it incredibly moving to, to read uh, at, the, at the top of the road about, about the project, to, to, re to remember those men who walked, who marched, in, as, as it says on the plaque beside the road, in short step down the slope to the, the quaysides. And there's that extraordinary poem by Carol Ann Duffy. Um, I mean, my goodness, I'm, I'm, I'm a... I'm afraid so I didn't know that poem. Um, it's called Unseen, and it starts with these two incredible lines. Down the quiet road, away, away, towards the dying time, 
And if, if you walk down, because the way it's laid out on the road, you get one line at a time as you walk down the road. It's incredibly moving. My goodness. And Folkestone, I mean, you are blessed. Folkestone, I, I know no other town or city in Britain that has such an extraordinary density of stories that are, that, that, that are being shared by regular passers-by. You know, you, wherever you walk, you're coming across stories written by poets, sculptors, their painters, the, 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 in, in the walls, the, the, their physical, sometimes their thoughts, an incredibly uh, strong sense of place. Amazing, amazing. Um, oh, this, this one here you'll know. I, so um, a few years ago, my son and I did, the, uh, did that, um, the Viking Trail and a couple of other trails going from Canterbury up to the North Coast, around uh, North Fall and South Fall and Deal, then back to Dover. Uh, over about three or four days, and this is this is the uh, the RFC memorial up on the the headland um, above Folkestone and um, above Dover, and um, uh, and it reminded me when I saw it of just how close. By the time we got the age of aircraft, how close, how small the channel had become. Uh, you could just hop over the channel, um, and. Uh, uh, so the, the, the idea of a long day in an open boat bringing your sheep and goats across at the beginning of the Neolithic has suddenly been switched for 20 minutes in an aircraft. Um, by the time we get to the Second World War, um, there are um, an enormous number of uh, monuments. And I must say, one of the many, many, many qualities of the Geopark idea is that it allows you to understand what was happening particularly during the Battle of Britain in the early years of the war, um, in, in England, much better by also crossing the water and seeing what was on the other side of the water. Um, so this, of course, is Dover Castle, um, with, the, with the chalk tunnels that you can go down, absolutely extraordinary. The Dover Patrol obelisks um, that are on both sides of the channel. Um, and um, on the, the French side, um, an extraordinary kind of uh, suite of uh, visitable uh, um, Second World War, I guess you could call them monuments now. Um, so there's the, 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 the V2 launch site at uh, La Coupole, uh, cut into the chalk. Um, that's, you know, if, if the geopark goes ahead, that'll be what they call a geo site. Um, there's the V2 assembly location at Epelec, the Epelec uh, blockhouse. Um, it's the only nature reserve I know that's been enhanced by bombing because the craters there are now uh, filled with water and it's become a network of ponds. Um, there's the, uh, uh, the Atlantic Wall Museum uh, between Calais and Boulogne. And uh, there's this uh, extraordinary installation here, the fortress of uh, Mimoyek, uh, that um, burrows into the, into the, the chalk as well. Um, and I think another, here's another picture of it too, people emerging from it. So these, these places are not just places to learn about the Second World War from the other side of the water, but also to have a walk. Um, a lot of these places are connected to walking trails and allow you to do two things at once, learn about the past, but also um, think about your good fortune to be uh, alive today and walking these footpaths. In the Kent Downs A and B, um, there's a, a huge range of, of, um, of sites from, from that, uh, that extraordinary six year period. Second World War, Biggin Hill, of course, the Battle of Britain Memorial at, just above here, Capital of Fern. Uh, and uh, Chartwell, uh, Winston Churchill's um, uh, home, National Trust now, but um, with, with, it, with its wood, own woodland walks. This is from the Chartwell walk. So next year um, will be the, the 80th anniversary of the Normandy landings. Um, and I guess you can see 1944 as being the beginning of the rebirth of the channel um, as open water. Um, La Manche as a connection between our two cultures. So time perhaps now to celebrate all that we share. So I'm going back to uh, Sanjeev's uh, Imperial uh, College um, uh, map showing the chalk connecting. Can you see, so you can see the dashed white line, bottom right, in the French side, the base of the chalk escarpment, re-emerging in Kent, uh, in the North Downs, heading as a diagonal to the top left-hand corner of the map. Very obvious connection there through the chalk, the chalk scarp. Um, this reflected, of course, in the shape of the, the proposed geopark. Um, I'm going to be very indulgent here and just read a short paragraph from my own book because um, 
Uh, I'd, I'd forgotten about this. I tend to finish a book, move on, uh, you know, and I completely forgotten what I've done. But I, I, I picked this off the shelf last night, thinking, oh, what did I think of short when I wrote this? This is quite an old book now. It's, it's called Coast, a long time ago, historic. Um, so um, uh, this is what I wrote of ch about chalk a long time ago. The Cretaceous bequ bequeathed England its greatest coastal icon. I reckon I've seen England's white cliffs from most angles. I remember staring into the salt haze as a child, trying to spot them from the decks of car ferries on the way back from summer holidays in France. I can hear my first skylarks hovering above the plucked grass at Cookmere. I've cycled over the white cliffs and I've kayaked beneath them. I've entered through them in wartime tunnels. Glimmering and vast, wrote Matthew Arnold out in the tranquil bay. The white cliffs of Dover might be half the height of Moers, that's the, the huge cliffs in Ireland, Moers cliffs, but they've become a national trademark and, a, and, a, and, a, and a, they become a national trademark with a stature way beyond their physical scale. George Lilly's map of 1546, showing the British Isles in hitherto unseen detail, marks forests, rivers, and rolling mountain ranges in Scotland, but just one stand of cliffs at Dover. Like the minarets of the Golden Horn or the Manhattan skyline, this blinding curtain of chalk veils us from outsiders, yet tells us who we are. Dover's white cliffs are where we advance closest to the continent and where we mark our perimeter. They are our first and last sight of home. Well, when I read that again, <laughs> last I thought, hang on, hang on, we were talking about Geopark here, we need to connect it, we're not hiding from anybody. So I think that's all rather out of date now. Um, so um, nevertheless, uh, why not the Golden Horn, Manhattan? We've got something very special here in Kent. Um, so um, coccoliths, um, yes, exactly, coccoliths. You're wondering why this is up here. This is, um, uh, this is, this is uh, a wonderful um, sculpture uh, by Instar near Oxted. Um, uh, a coccolith is absolutely tiny. Um, I don't know, San you'll have to ask Sanjeev when I finish exactly how you measure its tininess, but I do know that when I was shown one, I was looking through an electron microscope. Um, and they are one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen anywhere in the world. A coccolith is a, uh, an individual plate of, of calcium carbonate formed by single cell phytoplankton. Um, and they look like, under microscope, they look, they look like, um, buttons actually um, and uh, but they're arranged in a sphere lots of buttons in a, in a microscopic sphere um, and uh, they're, they're the kind of the, the building the building um, uh, they're not blocks what would they be um, particles an invisible part to the human eye particles that make up chalk and this um, this so this is a coccolith sculpture in the AOMB, and here it is again. And I put the, the, these pictures up because one of the things that I've learned over the, over the years is to, um, uh, and it started when I walked across Europe, is to move at the speed of thought. Um, as we know, we all move too quickly. And uh, if you just slow down and start looking and thinking about where you are, what you're looking at, um, uh, you can see the world in a new light. And I think, I mean, the coccolith sculpture here um, is, is a really great example. Um, you know, this, this is gigantic. Um, a, a coccolith is too small to see with the, with the human eye. Um, but it makes you think about chalk and about the view um, and about the beauty of, of the natural world. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm keen on moving slowly, moving imaginatively, whether walking or driving or cycling. Um, and uh, the key to, as I say, to moving imaginatively is moving at the speed of thought, not, not allowing yourself to move ahead until you really thought about where you are and what you're looking at. Um, and one of the beauties of this uh, geopark is that um, there's lots of opportunities for slowing down. Uh, these are very subtle landscapes. Um, uh, and there's been, and you know, we're not the first Britons to think that the PNR across the water is very, very beautiful. I mean, Dickens, Charles Dickens lived in Boulogne for three years from 1847. Um, and uh, he talked about the walks outside Boulogne as being delicious. He said, this is the best mix of city and countryside with sea air, moreover, that I know. Uh, so he was a great walker. He enjoyed this kind of, this subtle, I mean, you could be in the North Downs, couldn't you? But we're just across the water. It is very subtle, it's gentle. 
it's very thought provoking. Um, uh, Rambo, the, the poem, uh, wrote, um, was also visited this area and he wrote about a green hollow where a river is singing. Um, uh, here's Boulogne, uh, where Dickens lived for three years um, and where, of course, the French have lived for thousands of years. But um, <laughs> paint, th th this is. Uh, this is also where um, Edouard Manet, the painter, uh, did that, that wonderful, uh, executed that wonderful painting on the beach with its frisky sails and its sandy children, its parasols and its bathing machine, capturing that moment in 1873. Uh, Boulogne to Dickens was his favourite watering hole, uh, and he made this very interesting point that says a lot to me about the value of this geopark. This is what Dickens wrote about Boulogne. If it were but 300 miles further off, how the English would rave about it. <laughs> you know, we just got into the habit of not looking at what's right in front of us. And I'm, you know, I've, I've been as bad as everybody else. I always landed at Calais and thought, right, off I go. Um, never stopped to look around. Um, and the same is true on the, in the AONB. So here we've got the PNR, um, huge amount of scope. I mean, I love cycling and walking, so I mean, there's, there's weeks of walking and cycling in the PNR, and the same is true in the AONB. Here's the AONB. Um, the red dots, uh, railway stations. So if, like me, you like your journeys to be railway-based, I mean, look at the scope. Um, you can get out at one station, walk, get back in the train at another station, or take your bike on the train. You can cut between two lines. Um, uh, when I did the bike ride with my son, Kit, we, we took the train to Canterbury, north round the coast, took the train back to London from, from Dover. It's so easy. Um, and uh, the, the, the geopark is really well suited to uh, sustainable tourism. Um, and Rambo's River sings in Chiddingstone. Uh, what a gorgeous village. Uh, it's the River Eden here, and there's, a, there's an Eden Valley Walk. I'm sure many of you have done it. Um, and, of course, there's the North Downs Way um, and a lot of cycling routes. As I said, this is um, one of the, the Kent cycling routes. Um, so there's a huge amount to do, um, and um, uh, it is all um, potentially uh, on a level of sustainability which is not possible the moment you go to Gatwick or Heathrow. Um, now, um, I'd like to um, finish. Uh, here we are on, uh, I've done this rather backwards, but this is, this is one of the very first ever coast shoots. I'm sure you all know where it is. Uh, I said earlier on that when I, when I got the call to, to, to join Coast, um, uh, actually I didn't say it, I'm going to say it now, but when I got the, uh, the, the, I, I got the job to uh, present Coast, um, we had this big debate, you know, we're going, to, we're going to circumnavigate the whole UK coast, we're going to make 13 one-hour documentaries, it's the biggest documentary series ever on BBC Two, but where do we start? So where do you start if you're going to go right the way around the UK coast? You're going to finish at the same place. Where do you start? God, you should have heard the, the arguments. I'm really happy to say this is where we started, uh, on the White Cliffs of Dover. So this, you know, it's very interesting, isn't it? You have these debates in the media and you end up, you, everything brings you back to this, this short stretch of chalk um, on the edge of the English Channel. And... Um, and this place means a lot to me. So we got here the, in the director, camera and sound recordist and a, and a Dover Calais ferry below. Um, and uh, since, since that day, I, I think I made 80 coast programmes going around the whole of the UK coast and uh, other coasts abroad as well. And uh, in this little area here, I abseiled over the White Cliffs with Rory Mortimer, a geologist that Sanjeev knows well. I kayaked beneath the White Cliffs of Dover with the first young man to kayak around the whole of Britain. He, he finished here in Dover, so he started and finished in Dover. I sailed to France in a 100-year-old sailing trawler. That was pretty unpleasant. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, of course, all my own uh, most enjoyable journeys as a youngster started and finished at Dover on, on a cross-channel ferry. Um, so um, all paths lead to Dover, uh, and uh, it's the closest point to the continent. It's got its chalk, the Channel, La Manche. It's not a barrier or a gulf. It's an aquatic bridge. It's a connection, which is why this geopark is so exciting. It, it recognises our shared past and future. Um, you can see the AONB and the PNR effectively as siblings across the sea, the Bocage of Kent and the downland of the Cap and Marais, Cap, uh, the Cap and Marais d'Opal.
They're mirrored landscapes, effectively. And between them, the Channel, one of the world's busiest seaways used by 400 commercial vessels every single day. Well, we celebrate Piccadilly Circus, Edinburgh's Royal Mail. Why not the Dover Straits? So I just took this snapshot while I was filming uh, in the Coast Guard, Dover Coast Guard station. So I'm, it's not well composed. I just thought I'd really capture this moment, so I'll never be allowed in here again. But just, isn't it? Oh, it's a wonderful coincidence. But look at the way I, I was just, I, the, the map, the screen, shows the geopark, you know. So uh, even in the, in, the, in the Coast Guard Center, they're looking at what you're all trying to make happen. Um, so um, we filmed a huge amount uh, around here. Um, the geopark speaks for, um, for more uh, than two regions. It speaks for two countries, uh, a shared geology, shared culture, and shared landscapes. Um, I've been able to spend some quality time recently since I was invited down here thinking about the geopark, and uh, it has been a revelation. Um, this picture I, was taken by, by my son as it was getting dark, and I was completely blown out of the water by trying to keep up with him for three or four days going around the Kent coast, uh, looking down on, on Dover from, um, from that lovely National Trust uh, wild meadow at the top of the cliffs. Um, I'm struck so forcibly, having had time to think about it, um, by the ability of these two areas, one in France, one in Britain, and the Channel, a third one, to tell stories way beyond their boundaries. Um, last year, Professor Gupta demonstrated that the Channel mega flood is a story shared equally by France and England. It wasn't just that the flood itself occurred at the meeting of those two countries, but that its causes and effects were discovered by teams working on both shores. And the same can be said of the Geopark's human stories. Not only are they connected by the channel, but we can only really understand them fully if we visit and think about and enjoy sites in the PNR and the Kent Downs AONB. The channel that connects them is the all-important filling in the baguette, the, uh, the busy stretch of the marine biosphere on which the future of humanity depends, our oceans. So um, Kent Downs AONB and the um, PNR and the blue passage of water linking them are a whole. They're a book with lots of connected chapters and even more excitingly, they're a story far bigger than the hectares defined by their boundaries. They're a story about France and Britain. Now, as never before, we need to forge new connections between communities, between regions, between land and sea. The cross-channel UNESCO Global Geopark is both a symbol of hope for the future and an initiative of practical common sense. Thank you. Oh, so I looked up. Thank you so much. Um, I couldn't have put it better myself. <laughs> um, on, I've got a lot, I got a lot from that. We're going to have uh, now a short period of questions. Um, and Professor Gupta, Sanjeev Gupta and Nick uh, are going to start the questions. Um, and please take a seat, gentlemen. Um, and if there are questions from the audience, we'll come to those in a minute. Um, but I do recognize that not everyone there may be people who have questions but don't feel comfortable to ask them in this kind of environment. So do speak to us. There's several members of the team here. So if you have a question but you don't want to stand up in front of however many people are here, that's fine. Just get in touch with us. Um, and very quickly before Sanjeev kicks off, this wonderful lecture and Sanjeev's lecture last year and Anjana's lecture last year as well um, are all available on our website so you can, you can watch them again. Sanjeev, over to you. Thank you very much, and thank you so much, Nick. You talked about it as being a scamper, but it was really a romp. <laughs> a right, right romp through 6,000 years of history. Um, and it's just wonderful to hear this, these human stories, actually, because for me as a geologist, we have a geologist and a geographer here together. So either we will fight, or we will be here all night, and you won't be able to leave till past midnight. Um, but um, you showed us this, you really took us away from 
the geology to the human, the landscape. So tell us a little bit more about what your feelings are. When does geology become landscape? What, what do you think about that? That's such a good issue, isn't it, Sanjeev? I, I, um, I, I was steeped uh, as an undergrad in Hoskins and the making of the English landscape. So, uh, and my grandmother insisted that I, she gave me as a, as a teenager a copy of um, Alec Clifton Taylor's uh, book, which links architecture to geology. It's the kind of, the, the classic textbook mm -hmm. published back in the 60s. And so, I kind of, I was, in, in my head, I think I've always been, uh, I've been a closet geologist. You know, I didn't have the chemistry to do it properly. Uh, and I always... I don't have it. <laughs> and and, 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 and it's, it is fantastically complicated and quite abstract, um, unless you're a, a, a chemist or, uh, and, and, uh, and, and very good at analyzing, and, and computers nowadays, of course. Mm. Uh, and I, I was always drawn to the stories. So historical geography, uh, which does refer to geology a lot, was, was kind of my thing. Um, so Hoskins, Alec Clifton Taylor, um, and actually people like Richard Forty. I thought Richard Forty, who's a geologist, whose wonderful books have put geology in front of us as a, as a, as a, as a kind of uh, people like me, ignorant readers. You know, I, can, I get it in, in Richard Forty's books. But I do think... Um, you know, without, without understanding the basics of the geology, you cannot begin to understand why a landscape looks the way it does. So the chalk, for example, uh, to me, I think a lot of Eric Revilius, the, the painter who was tragically killed in the Second World War, but his, his watercolours are suffused with chalky light. And he lived and loved in the downlands down here. Uh, he was a war artist, but even his pictures of battleships and aeroplanes are suffused in a chalky light. It's a very, um, it's a very gentle, it's, it's the newest, the youngest, as I understand it, rock in, in the British sequence. And um, it's, it's soft, uh, it's blindingly white. It, it's, it, it, it hides its layers of flint, without which the Mesolithic and Neolithic, the Stone Age couldn't have been as successful. It's an incredibly evocative mm. storyteller. Mm. Uh, to me, the most evocative story. I mean, you can go up to the Isle of Lewis and look at Louis C. and I think, well, you know, that's the oldest rock we've got or whatever. But actually, it doesn't do as much for me as chalk does. It's a real storyteller. Yeah. So what do, you, what do you think the impact would have been of chalk on early peoples? You know, we have this pristine white nature. Do you, do you have a sense of how they would have viewed this, how they would have, would it have been special as a landscape for them, or...? Yeah, I, th I, th I'm, I'm, I, th I mean, they, they gravitated towards it, so it's very interesting to see that the early, that the, the Mesolithic in northern France um, were congregated around flint mines, they built their settlements near the flint mines, they were farming on flint downland, and right. when they crossed the water to here, they almost immediately started mining on the South Downs. And a lot of the early Neolithic sites are in the chalk downlands. And if you, if you go up into Wiltshire, you find Stonehenge uh, on chalk, in the, mm. in the chalklands there, and uh, Avebury. And I, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a building stone, or um, oh, unless it's, is it called clunch? Is that the very hard, the hard chalk called clunch yes. that you can build it? Yeah. A lot of chalk is just too crumbly to build yeah. with. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's an incredible um, construction material because it, uh, you have to imagine things like uh, Neolithic monuments, the, the long barrows, and, and there's, a, there's a Neolithic um, monument called the Cursus, which is up to 10 kilometres long and would have been a pair of parallel walls, maybe 5 metres or 10 metres apart, but as high, high as a human being, two parallel walls. But just imagine them built out of chalk with no entr only one entrance. So you get inside them and you're in this parallel walled white chalk corridor across the downland. They, they must have looked incredible. You couldn't have done that with, in any other geology than chalk. Yeah. Okay, so that, that's <laughs> beautiful evocation of these people, etc. cetera. What, what sort of, how do they use the landscapes, do you think? These early people. I mean, in, we've talked about them being aware in some sort of um, aesthetic sense, but how do they use the landscapes? That's a really good question, and archaeologists are kind of changing their views on this because um, for a long time it was it was popularly thought that 
Mesolithic and Neolithic people would have used ridgeways, you know, mm. because we've got the North Downs, the South Downs, the the uh, the ridgeway uh, that, uh, running south of Oxford, uh, the Marlborough Downs. You know, that Britain has a lot of ridgeways, and there was this general thought. Uh, this is based on no archaeological evidence. It was just like adding two and two and getting five. That because they're relatively level, high up. Uh, and you had good views, uh, there were like motorways in the sky, that they must therefore have been kind of long distance footpaths, travel, travel routeways. So but, they were, essentially they were engineered routeways. So we think of yeah. footpaths these days as nice places we go on Sunday afternoon yeah. and walk some, but actually at that time there would have been engineering structures. Well, well they, no, they, they did. I don't think they really, I don't think the thought was that they'd altered the topography of the right. downs to make the ridgeways, but that they were so obviously routeways when you looked at them, then they, they must have been routeways. Right. In fact, it's now thought because there is no, if, if they had been routeways, we'd have, we'd have found lots of Mesolithic camps along them, right. but they haven't found them. Okay. And if it was, so it's now thought, to answer your question, and this is very pertinent to, to Kent, that, um, that people in the Mesolithic and Neolithic were, were very much adhering to river, river valleys and coasts okay. where you, had, you could maximize your sources of food and shelter. So all of the, the, the sites invariably close to drinking water um, and where you would also have access to, to timber for burning, for building shelters. There would always have been game and of course you had fish in the rivers. So rivers were the obvious place to go. And so we have to think of people in Kent kind of wending their way along the River Eden and, mm. uh, and so on um, in quite convoluted ways um, and probably returning to camps that they'd used before or their ancestors had used. Mm. So very much riverine, riper riparian yeah. route ways. Okay. So let's turn to actually the channel. And, uh, you know, we generally, and gen generally think of the channel as a barrier. But in your talk, actually, you brought up the word, I hadn't really thought of this as a water bridge. No, you know, I've worked on that channel for a long time, but I've never thought of it as a water bridge, and you talk very much about it as a water bridge. So tell us a little bit more about your thinking there. Yeah, well, I, I'm, I, I did... Uh, this is really based on uh, a few experiences I had on reconstructed Stone Age boats uh, when I was convinced, uh, by having been out on them, how incredibly versatile... Uh, they and, and well thought out they are. So actually, the the Dover boat is really quite a heavy, clunko car, clunky cargo ship. But um, I did a film shoot in Ireland once with a German archaeologist who has built a number of Mesolithic coracles, big coracles, not one person cor coracles big enough to to take half a ton of uh, cargo and several people. And uh, we took one of these out on Loch Ness, just two of us, and the thing was almost planing. It was so fast. I mean, I wouldn't want to be in a, in, in a hurricane, but no problem crossing a channel at all. Um, and it's now very clear because Mesolithic camps have been found on lots of Scottish islands that in, and, and all the way along the British coastlines that almost certainly... Um, they used uh, a, a technique of navigation called coasting, where you, just as you memorize um, way marks on a footpath, so, or a routeway, so that you can repeat that route a year later, they memorized uh, sea marks as they were coasting. So they were, and, and the White Cliffs of Dover would have been an absolute classic, you know, mm. unmissable, always gonna recognize them. And actually what they'd have been looking for in a small bar, I remember once kayaking from, deal back to Dover um, in the sea kayak and actually what you, uh, one chalk cliff looks a bit like another one so what you're looking for are the silhouettes of prominent trees on the top of the cliffs and on the gaps in the cliffs so if you've got a little little stream or river going through a cliff you've got a very clear cleft ravine that you can memorize very easily so that's what they'd have been recording and and I suspect that um, the channel I and mean, we're not talking about busy as it is now with yeah. sort of you know, thousands of ships a week, but um, 400 a day. But um, uh, clearly by the Neolithic, there were people crisscrossing to and fro on a day like this pretty, pretty regularly in, in open boats that you could either paddle or sail. Okay. So when do you think historically that the idea of a barrier came through? Or is, is there any sense oh, of that? I 
because I have a sense now from what your talk question. is. I've never thought of that. Um, from you your think? talk, I have a sense of you know, this, this being a living see, water bridge, as you yeah. say, you know, with constant crossing over, connection, and... Well, I guess, you know, you only have to look back at Caesar and uh, Napoleon and the, the, you know, the, the constant wars with France through the, mm. through the Middle Ages... Um, to see that it's, uh, you know, just as the Normans built their Mott and Bailey castles, the, the, the English Channel and its defensive cliffs are a very convenient natural defence. Mm. So I think probably, I'm, well, I'm, there have been far too many ex reasons uh, to treat it as a barrier uh, because militarily it's, it's, it's been very successful at that. Yeah. And you have to, uh, you know, wonder, you know, obviously, you know but for that 20 mile void, you know, what would have happened in 1940? Yeah. Um, uh, because it doesn't seem as if, uh, you know, Hitler had a lot of trouble mm. m marching into the other countries in continental Europe, um, in Western Europe. Uh, and you presumably wouldn't have had too much trouble if, if Doggerland had still existed and it's <laughs> driven the tanks across the North Sea. Um, so, but I mean, I, 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 I think it's time to move on. You know, we're, it is a long time ago. It's, it's, it's a long time since we had a plausible reason for regarding the channel as a barrier or as a gulf. Yeah. And we have every reason in the world for treating it as the complete opposite now, as something that connects us. And it does connect us, you know, Eurostar, the ferries, um, uh, you know, if somebody who doesn't even like going on open water can sail a boat across to France, and you know, <laughs> there, are, there are other ways. I'd like to ride a sea kayak, actually. That would be yeah. something I would enjoy doing one day. So, I mean, with this geopark formed, do you, do you see that as the big connection now? That I do. Forming? I mean, I just sound, I'm coming to the geopark very late, and I feel a bit silly for that. I don't know why I didn't know about it um, a couple of years ago, but. Um, I think it's, it's inspired, absolutely inspired of the moment. And if ever there is a symbol, symbolic moment to leave behind all of those prejudices and misconceptions about the difference between us and our neighbors just across the water, this is it. Mm. This is really it. And, and I think one device of many would be, I, th I think the chalk connecting device is brilliant because it physically connects us. You know, it's, what it's saying is, you know, uh, you know the, this bit of water has actually got a much more significant uh, natural uh, line at right angles to it connecting two countries. Don't think about the water, think about the chalk running mm. underneath it from side to side. Absolutely brilliant. Um, but of course, now that we're, we're desperately trying to reach uh, net zero as rapidly as possible as the climate crisis intensifies, we simply have to find new ways of enjoying our world sustainably. And what a brilliant, sustainable option the geopark is. It's so intelligent, you know. There's so many stories, so many places to go to, whether you're in a car, electric car, or whether you're on a bicycle or, a, or, a, or, or using your walking boots. You know, connect. You can you can you can be abroad in a very different place, yet in some way that's right next door. Okay, thank you very much. Well, I'd like to now open it up for some questions. Um, I can't actually see the audience because the lights are so bright. So maybe the lights could come up, and uh, we'll take some. We have time for some questions. So please raise your hands, and we've got some microphones going around. So don't be shy. Here's your moment. <laughs> can I see any hands up? Could I ask you something, Sanjeev, while yes. we're waiting to see them? Because I'm, I'm, what, what, what's, um, I know that your research nowadays is, is, uh, has a lot to do with Mars, which is you know, very remote from chalk in Kent. But what, what do you, as a geologist, what does chalk mean to you? I think it's just something so distinctive and also it represents such a distinct time period in Earth history and a climate in Earth history, this super greenhouse time. This really it feels like a super greenhouse today, actually. I'm not sure why I'm wearing this jacket. Um, so we're back in the Cretaceous here. So it's just something really, really special. But also, I think we, we think we own the chalk, but we don't. And actually, it was a huge seaway, a 
sea that is spread across vast regions of the world at that time, a shallow sea. So it, it is broader than just our chalk things. And that, that, it, there's something very, very special about it which we just don't have with other geologies, really. And what does it... I, I, I've only looked at a coccolith once. Um, could you just describe geologically a coccolith? Because I struggle to find the right words. Because I'm, I'm, and I can describe something I can see, but actually what I looked at through the electron microscope was staggeringly beautiful. It might have been a planet in a different yeah. galaxy. Yeah, so it's, it's not something... I'm not a paleontologist. It's, they're just intricate and beautiful. So I see them as beautiful objects. They're just yeah. intricate jewels, if you like, that have been... You know, sometimes you have these um, sculptures made by... Artis of artists, microscopic, it almost looks human carved mm, in its beauty, yeah. and etc. They're just remarkable features. Yeah. So, perfect moment. Uh, we haven't got any questions, we've run out of time. Oh. But talking about the beauty and the artistic nature of the coccoliths, coccolith spores that make up chalk, is, it, is a wonderful moment to conclude. Um, because the festival that continues now for the rest of the weekend is riven, filled with artistic interpretations of the geology and of our landscapes and the nature of that geology. Um, and we'll celebrate this, this ambition. And, and Nick, thank you for your ringing endorsements of the idea. Um, the ambition of creating a, a cross-channel geopark um, for these mirror landscapes which are connected by the channel. So, so pick up the program um, and join in. It's free, nearly all free. Um, the, we the weather is set fair. So join us over the, over the weekend. Um, support the ambition. Get involved. Sign up. Um, feedback. We have a, a feedback program. Uh, a feedback sheet, so we really want to hear from you. It gives you the opportunity to hear more about the Kent Downs and about the Geopark. Um, and if anyone has questions that they didn't feel comfortable to ask in the, um, in the open forum, then just come up and have a chat. Our doors are always open. Get in touch with the AMB. Um, there's a QR code and our website's there. And there's a number of other amazing lectures about about the chalk and the channel and the geopark. So with that, I'd just like to thank both Sanjeev and Nick again. Um, wonderful to see you both and a fantastic lecture. Thank you, Nick. Um, so if we just thank our speakers um, and enjoy the rest of your evening.